a couple things we need from last time. I just remind you about the superfields. The superfields have components which are phi <coughs> plus uh, theta times psi, so fermionic piece. And then there's this auxiliary field theta theta f, where the auxiliary field is is a um, it gets integrated out at the end. And you proceed by writing down a superpotential, which is a function of the fields, the superfields, which could have linear terms, could have quadratic terms, and almost always has cubic terms. And the way you get from that to the real potential is you you integrate over the super over the Grassmann coordinates, and v turns into dw d phi i. So this is the this is the scalar component times f plus d squared w d phi i phi j psi i psi j. And then finally the the f gets integrated out and these f terms turn into dw sum over i dw d phi i squared. So those are the f terms. Those, those, are, there's also some of these so-called d terms which I talked about, but my examples today all live in the f sector. Okay, so you can see this this type of guy gives you you power couplings live right there. Um, if you had some some mass terms here, you take one derivative. Here you get one phi. You square it. You get a mass term. Those are mass terms. So you can sort of see where various things come from there. Okay, so that's what I need from last time. So various properties besides besides bosons and fermions interchanging. Okay, one one important one that's very interesting is that the cosmological constant is equal to zero in, in unbroken symmetry. And this comes from the following. It comes from, we saw it last time, we had the anti-commutator of two charges. Let me take its vacuum expectation value. That's uh, with two sigma bar mu, p mu, where the zeroth component of that is one and the zeroth component of this is the Hamiltonian. So this there's no momentum in the vacuum. The energy of the vacuum it's then zero two times the Hamiltonian, which is two times the cosmological constant. Okay. So if if the vacuum is invariant, that's the statement that Q acting on the vacuum gives zero. Okay, that's that's the statement of invariance of the vacuum. The charge generates a, a, a change in the state, and so. It, if, if the vacuum is invariant, that's equal to zero, implies the cosmological constant is equal to zero. So unbroken CZ always has zero cosmological constant. You can't add just the constant to the Lagrangian. Because that wouldn't, you wouldn't be consistent with this relationship here. Of course, the supersymmetry ends up being broken, and if if 
if you know if, if Susie is broken is broken at a TV, then you'd expect the cosmological constant is to be one TV to the fourth, which is only off by 60 orders of magnitude. So uh, it's better than better than making them Planck to the fourth, but it's it's still not the best. In fact, you know, in some sense, I worry that this is um, a liability. Because if you're starting from zero, and you'll see that the supersymmetry breaking always leads to a positive shift in the energy, what's your chance of ending back at zero when, you're, when your shift is 60 orders of magnitude? Okay. It, it's, it's hard to, it might be a liability starting from zero. It might be better to start from some, some negative value and end up at zero or something. Okay. But be that as it is, we have no, that's, that's philosophy. There's a bunch of non-renormalization theorems Um, which basically come from the fact that there are so many cancellations. So, example, the cosmological constants, one of them, even if you do radiative corrections at all orders, you get no shifts in the cosmological constant. These often lead to flat directions, which I'll, we'll show you one. You often have states that have equal energies that um, so if you have a pot potential function of fields, you often have flat directions and the potentials where changing some field doesn't change the energy. Okay, that's a typical thing. And then of course there's, there's tight constraints on couplings. You will see some of this in the Higgs sector. You just can't, it's, it's good news in a way, you can't just arbitrarily do anything you want, you're constrained by the symmetry. Uh, and that's, okay. So there's supersymmetry. The, the case for weak scale supersymmetry. So let's imagine that you want Susie to exist. Why does it exist at the weak scale? Okay, one is to stabilize the Higgs. So we we saw that if you if you take a Lagrangian that has fermion couplings, the psi bar psi times the Higgs, and it has scalar couplings. Um, it's called GS squared, um, H squared, phi squared, and you do loops. You do fermion loops and scalar loops. So those are the two, two things. You end up, both those give quadratic divergences. You get a shift in the Higgs mass. It's the answer turns out to be gf squared over 4 pi squared, lambda squared plus mf squared plus to minus, the crucial minus sign, minus gf squared over 4 pi squared, gs squared over 4 pi squared, lambda squared plus mf squared, so there's f, the scalar. So supersymmetry allows this coupling if you said GF equals to GS, so that's a supersymmetry relation, turns into then GF squared over 4 pi squared, M F squared minus MS squared. And so if that's not too big, so you've done two things. If it's not too big, you have a natural explanation of why the quadratic cutoff doesn't doesn't matter, so it's stable. 
and also then why its natural scale is. It has the natural scale of that mass splitting times some coupling constant. Okay. So this says that you, you, you can't make it work with supersymmetry at the Planck scale. You have to make it work with supersymmetry at the weak scale. Okay, so that's motivation number one. Motivation number two, as I mentioned, is the running couplings. If you take the minimal supersymmetric standard model plus a desert, a desert means there's no new physics up to the up to 10 to the 16 GeV. Then the coupling constants run into unison. Okay, that's. And the third motivation is that there's supersymmetry has good candidates for dark matter. Lightest supersymmetric partic particle has reasonable properties for dark matter. Okay. So those are the things that say, say we want it down at the weak scale. If you wanted to, you, you could make a, a couple things about cosmology that say you don't want it at the weak scale. There's, there's a bunch of things like overproduction of, of, of uh, gluinos and things like that that come from gravi gravitational physics. They're not insurmountable. So, let's just put it that way. So construction, uh, the, uh, you know, some and their model construction. What I, what I want to do, that my, my goal today is really just take you through, tour you through the issues of this um, minimal supersymmetric standard model and show you where, where interesting things happen, what, what the ingredients are, what the buzzwords are. So first thing is there's really no, there's no simplification you know, you might try to hope that the Higgs is the partner of some quark or lepton that doesn't work. There's basically, you, you construct it by adding a, a, a superfield for every known particle. So that hasn't helped that much. Um, of course, the optimist says we've, we've found half of the supersymmetric particles that way. Yes. <laughs> okay, we've got ha half of every, multi every single multiple. There's an extra Higgs. That's a nice feature in that it, it uh, well, it, it's not simpler, but it's a very distinctive feature. So we should be able to, that should be a great test of supersymmetry. There's no simplification in the parameters too. There's basically, there's 105 extra parameters. Okay, so that's, yeah. That's actually, I think that counting, I, I clearly didn't count them personally. Uh, that's, that's from some paper. I think that's before the neutrinos. So it's taking standard model before neutrinos and minimal symmetric standard model before neutrino masses. After that, the, there's, there's more in both of the cases. So it's, but that's the, the order of magnitude. The, the, the fourth thing, which is that, that even though we don't like fine tuning, the flavor physics needs to be fine-tuned. So when we did flavor physics, you know, our little mini thing on flavor physics, we saw how that's sensitive to stuff at the T TEV scale. And if you just let these 105 par parameters be whatever they want to be, you're going to violate that in general. So you have to adjust them rather, rather strikingly. Um, and then there's various other little things 
the 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 theory doesn't uh, automatically conserve baryon number. So you actually impose it by an extra symmetry. It's this R parity. I'll say that again, though I'm not going to say it too deeply. There's an issue of the what's called the mu problem, which I will talk about. There's the what the nature of nature of supersymmetry breaking is an issue. And then there's the issue of why it just happened where it did. Okay. Uh, why? you'll see that the, from the nature of supersymmetry breaking, supersymmetry actually breaks far away from the weak scale. And somehow, we have to get that scale out of it. That's completely unknown. So it's related in a way to the, what's the, the mu problem. OK. So but let's just plug ahead. The, the super potential. OK, so we have a chiral superfield for all the fermions and then and the Higgs. So the Higgs also lives in a chiral superfield. So you write out the superpotential. And it has all this. It's, it's actually pretty simple. It has um, things like you are some Yukawa matrix for the, for the um, uptype particles, Q left. Higgs, let's call it Higgs uptype. So there's two Higgs, one, one couples to uptypes and one couples to downtypes. I'll show you that a little more later too. But um, so there's Higgs uptypes, but that's the type of thing you would have written out before. There's um, d bar y minus sign uh, d q left. Higgs up types, and then there's two left on, two left on Yukawa's. And then the last term is is this mu term, mu Higgs up, Higgs down. Okay. The this guy, you can sort of see from what we did before that when I take the super potential, I take dw d phi times f. I get that piece there. Then I integrate out the f goes to sum over i dw d phi i squared. OK, so if I do this, it gives me um, mu times um, gives. I take one derivative. I get h d and mu, and I square it. So I get mu squared h d squared. I take the other one. I, with respect to the other field, I get mu squared h u squared. So this turns into mass terms for the Higgs. It's mu squared h u squared plus h d squared. Okay, now a little bit careful. This, this, this top guy is the super field. This is the, the scalar field. Okay, this, is, this, this has all the other components also, so there are other things along. This is the only dimensionful parameter. The Yukawas don't have dimensions. Okay, so in the Higgs, so there's a dimensionful parameter there. That's that's related to the mu problem coming up, coming up. Okay. So there's a Higgs mass parameter. Okay. There's actually a couple other terms also. 
There could also be terms that look like um, lepton writes QIs um, let's see, down conjugates. Yeah, these, these, these are two quark type things that are put in color singlets. And there's also ways to do color singlets of three quark type things, U, D, D. No, not quite. Okay. Those things are allowed. The, these type of things violate baryon number. Okay, so there are th things in the superpotential that you can write down that violate barrier number, and you you um, need to forbid them. There's a simple symmetry that that forbids them. The the this discrete symmetry. Is this R parity? It's minus one to the three b minus l plus two times the number, twice the spin. Okay, so spin is conserved at all vertices. That that doesn't do too much. But then this conserves ends up conserving b minus l, which the standard model also conserves. Okay, so. It leads to the conservation of B minus L, just like just like the the standard model though, does also. So that's that, and that's sort of just found by just looking at what what needs to be. There's no reason why it's there. It's, it's imposed. Okay, it has the the consequence that because of this plus 2s part here, that the, the, all the standard model particles have, have r parity equal to plus 1, and all their particles, the, the partners, have r parity equals minus 1, So that's the they then all get differentiated this way, and this then implies that the lightest supersymmetric particle is stable. There's the fact that that all the partners carry the negative one r parity means that, that there's no no couplings that turn them into the others. Okay, so the lightest one is stable. That's, that's a positive consequence from a symmetry that you, that you wouldn't have guessed ahead of time. But it's good, it's good then for dark matter. You then have to, you want to arrange this thing to be neutral for dark matter. Yeah, so all the interactions that come out here conserve overall spin. It's, and it's, it's, it comes from you know, tech, the technical place where it comes is way back here where you put them all in the same multiplet. But this guy carries this Grassmann variable here. When you integrate over the Grassmann variable, the only things that remain, you don't get terms that mix that to that directly. You get terms that mix two of these when you integrate over the Grassmann variable. So basically, the, when you, the fact that when you remove this by integration, you end up with bilinears of fermions is just the, is where, where, where it comes from. Okay. 
the formalism is built to to do that appropriately. Okay. Okay. So there's there's that's basically the construction. I mean, I, I haven't told you too much about the Higgs, but that's that's it. You basically should take you take that. You have a supersymmetric standard model, with one exception, and that's supersymmetry breaking. So here's here's a very brief and incomplete treatment of supersymmetry breaking. Okay, there's a basic problem, and you you we we saw it already. The the Hamiltonian looks like the sum over these charges, Q dagger I, Q I, is a positive definite quantity. It's always bigger than zero. And supersymmetry, unbroken supersymmetry, gives this its minimum possible value. If it's a positive definite quantity, and the ground state, the supersymmetric ground state, is is um, has zero energy. Then, then you you can, there's no states in the theory, given this Hamiltonian, that have less than zero energy. So you can't you can't use um, minimum of, of but any potential. Okay, so you know our usual way of finding the ground state is you find find the potential, you look for its minimum, and that minimum tells you whether the symmetry is there or not. In this case, the the supersymmetry, you know, any other possible minimum, you know, some primes, always have to have energies greater than zero, because if those charges don't annihilate, if they break the state. So for a broken state, then then the energy can only be greater than zero if it's not zero. Okay. So we need a different strategy, and the, the strategy then is that you 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 need to somehow make the the usual vacuum impossible. So it's sort of it's not the minimum of some energy, it's just that there's no possible way to get there. Okay? And the the best example, the one the one I'll do for you is F term breaking. Otherwise known as O'Rafferty, and I'll try spelling it. T A I G H. O'Rafferty. And um, it's pronounced like 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 Rafferty is a sort of an American Irish name, just like Donahue, and the G H is equally equally. Uh, unpronounced. Okay, so O'Rafferty breaking takes the the superpotential. It's it, it let's do it with it's done with three fields minus k phi one. So it's the superpotential plus m phi two phi three plus y over two. Phi one, phi two squared. Okay, so there's there's a seemingly innocuous one. If you take, so remember we take we take dW d phi i times 
f i, and then that, so i in this case runs over this 1, 2, and 3, and then turns into sum over i of dw d phi squared. Okay, so if we do this, this says that the, the true potential is, well, if I take phi 1, I get um, minus k plus uh, y over 2 phi 2 squared. If I take the, the respect to phi 2, I get m phi 3 squared. And I take respect to um, phi three, I get uh, I get m phi two plus y phi. See, that was phi three. Did I say I thought phi three squared. No, y phi three. Phi three phi one. Okay, well, the, and this was 3 here, because it was phi 1. Okay. The, the conflict comes here. If you're trying to set this e equal to 0, uh, if you, if you set phi 3 is equal to 0, then this is greater than 0. If, if you said phi, this, make this thing vanish, then this thing is bigger than 0. Okay. So there's <coughs> um, the minimum, the minimum, turn, if you look, go through that, the minimum turns out to be at um, phi 2, 2, equals phi 3 equals 0, where v has the, the magnitude k squared, so supersymmetry is broken at the minimum. There's just no way to get down to v is equal to 0. Okay. The other thing, so that's, that's that breaks the supersymmetry then, and then you go through and get, there are other consequences. Um, the other thing that, that you see in this is once that you're at that minimum, there is one of these flat directions around because if I set phi 2 and phi 3 is equal to 0, all the terms are 0, but phi 1 then disappears. Phi 1 is anything. So th this is one of the flat directions. That's the minimum. There's, that's, it's unconstrained. Okay. Okay. The there's so that's that's one way to break supersymmetry. The the other way, the other easy way, the other easy example is d term which goes by phi a Iliopolis. Iliopolis. I, I think there's no u there. All right. um, which is just adding to the Lagrangian a term that's some constant times. The d field, um, I don't have the analysis of that set up. But they, they both share a common result. This is a very universal result. This is a basic. Okay. Is it after supersymmetry breaking? The, what's called the super trace of the mass squared is equal to zero, which is, it's basically a comment about the splittings that come out. If you sum over j, 
minus 1 to the j, 2j plus 1. j is actually the spin variable. Trace mj squared that s equals 0. So it's, it's typical of many times when you split things. You split them, one goes up, one goes down. Here, here they this this they end up having this relationship for the resulting masses. And try as you you might, this doesn't work in the standard model. So if you take the, the, the supersymmetric particles, or the, the normal particles, and you put them in the trace, and you put all the partners in it and put them up beyond the experimental bounds, you can't satisfy this. Okay? So you, you get forced in the supersymmetric standard model to take the supersymmetry breaking is beyond even the 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 MSFM. So it's not contained in the, the minimal supersymmetric standard model. Okay, so what you end up doing is you imagine a hidden sector. Okay, it doesn't live at the TV scale. It's just some other other portion of the world which can you can dream up any way you want. Supersymmetry gets broken in this sector. and gets transmitted in some way to the MSSM. This is a black box here. The only thing that, the only constraint is that it has to be flavor blind. Okay, blind. And that's because if it isn't, if there's some, the mechanism of does it, mixes up flavor symmetries, then, then you really fail all these tests big time. And so there's, you'll hear about gravity mediated. This happens with the Planck scale. And then the different masses of these, the gravi graviton and gravitino make a difference. Anomaly mediated. Gauge mediated. Uh, yeah, and so there's all these. The consequences of those are slightly different. You know, gravity media has a gravitino. There's Goldstone fermions, the Goldstinos. That sometimes you get out of these sectors, but this is this is not the MSSM. So how what, how does one treat that then? The the treatment of these things comes from so-called soft Susie breaking. Okay, and these are where all the parameters come. Okay. So, you know, if you looked at the the Lagrangian, the, the superpotential that we had there, it had about the same number of parameters as the standard model. There was Yukawa couplings for all the different masses, and then it had a the mu term, which is like the contribution to the to the Higgs potential. You know, so that's about the same number. So here's where all the extra stuff comes. It it basically you you allow all sorts of Susie breaking terms
with the constraint that the that the mass dimension of the coefficient is um, positive. Okay, so what does this mean? So hard breaking would be something like lambda phi to the fourth. If you just throw in a dimensionless coupling constant, that's hard breaking. Okay. If, you, if you do that, you'll end up, if you just sort of do it by hand, you'll fi end up finding the quad quadri quadratic divergences come back. If you, a soft one would be something like m squared phi squared. So there's positive mass dimension for the coefficient. Okay. The the beauty of that term then was when you put this into a loop, you will get delta m hig squared is so let's call it m soft m soft squared. You know you, the coefficient comes there, and then the only thing that you can have then is log lambda. Um, you, dimensionally, you can't get lambda squared anymore. Plus, you know, plus BM soft, things like that. So you, you get, by having positive mass dimensions, you get rid of lambda squareds when you do loops. Just, okay? So there's, there's, if you do this, you don't need, once you have these, You, there's no further fine-tuning. Okay. But you, the, you just basically at this stage pull them out of a hat. You just say, what are the things that I can do? So let's just do some of them. So I guess I can probably, no, I can't squeeze it there. So L soft. Well, the, you, there's a bunch of parameters. There's, there might be things like M1BB. These are the, these are the multiplets that contain the U1 gauge boson plus M2WW plus M3GG. These are these are gay genome masses. Actually, these are, I'm sorry, I should put twiddles on these things. They're the masses of the partners, the supersymmetric partners. So gauge enos. So you just arbitrarily say, I'm going to give them some mass. You can give the quarks masses by the squarks, sorry. So squarks are next. Um, so there's something like A1 U squark quark Higgs plus, so there's a bunch of things that give squarks the, the big masses. And then you can give um, different masses to the the two Higgs uh, minus M D squared H D squared. Okay. So remember the mu term gave them equal masses. Here you give them some extra mass terms. And you can there's an extra term that which is written mu B H U H D. It's a mixing term. Okay, so these are written out straight in the Lagrangian, not in the superpotential. In the superpotential, they would conserve supersymmetry. Here, they just write you write them out. Okay, so they break supersymmetry. Okay, 
So there's there's all these new parameters. Okay. So hit Higgs vector. I'll come back to those in a minute. I'll come back to no, but I need to. Hit, I'm going to come back in the context of electroweak symmetry breaking. Okay. So first, I, I want to, there's two Higgs, and the question is why? Okay. Why do you need two Higgs? Well, there's two parts of this. The uh, first, let's recall in the standard model that you have phi, which is phi plus phi zero, and also phi twiddle, which was i tau two phi star, is also a doublet, and we use them to get the Yukawa couplings. Um, U bar, D bar left, you know, phi plus phi zero, D right, that went like MD, and the other, so that was, that was, this is phi, the other one was U bar, D bar left, it's phi twiddle, u right, this guy has the, it's phi zero and minus phi zero bar, or minus phi, it's phi zero bar, and minus phi minus down there. Okay, this turns into m u, so be the the vacuum expectation value sits in the upstairs piece. Okay, so w you need to use phi and phi star. So, of the reasons for two, the first reason is that if I make a superpotential out of phi, so here's a superpotential which contains phi, uh, its partners, and theta. When I take phi star, a superfield, phi, phi star would contain this field and theta, theta bar, which is the other chirality, and also contains theta. I mean, I haven't given you the technology to do that. But the, the basic point is that the superpotential is the superpotential that only involves theta, no theta bars. And so it can't include Um, phi star, because phi star contains theta bar. Okay, so you the, you can't con use phi and phi star in the superpotential, so you can't get out this. The solution by having a phi uh, Higgs but Higgs down, which is a function of theta, which has this doublet structure, uh, phi zero, no, phi plus phi zero, and uh, another superfield for Higgs of the uptype theta, which is then um, so phi phi one phi one phi two. Zero, phi minus two. 
Okay, so there's two different types of fields. They're both superfields involving thetas, but they have different charges. Okay, so there's there's reason number one. Reason number two comes from anomalies. Okay. Remember we anomalies are due to fermions. So we have fermions there. And we we got the construction of the standard model by having all the gauge anomalies cancel. Okay. But all of a sudden now, so we have all the same old fermions, but all of a sudden now we have have an extra fermion. And that extra fermion is the the partner of the Higgs, the Higgs eno. The fermion partner of the Higgs. And so the, all the anomaly cancellations get thrown off. So the only way that the, the way you solve that is you then ha have yet one more in the second, so t two Higgs, such that they cancel all anomalies. So you get forced into two Higgs for that reason also, the anomaly cancellation. And it's also true that, that the quadratic terms wouldn't cancel, but that's that's related to the other two. So these are the two big reasons for Higgs, two Higgs. Okay. Then, after you got the Higgs, you want to do electroweak symmetry breaking. Okay. So electroweak symmetry breaking. Now, now that you've you've broken supersymmetry, you go back down to minimizing potential. So it's not done by that O'Rafferty trick. So it's it's totally driven by the soft terms. Okay. So it, there's no sense that, that symmetry breaking is ex explained by supersymmetry. It doesn't predict that the symmetry is broken. You have to force it to work. And the the Higgs potential has the following form. It has mu squared plus m up type squared h up squared plus mu squared plus m down type squared h down squared plus mu b uh, h up h down and then there are some gauge inter gauge in gauge interactions which kind of are g1 squared plus g2 squared over 8 h up squared minus h down squared okay this comes from the fact that the the up and down carry opposite hypercharges to cancel all the anomalies so that, that those come from anomaly cancellations. If you've got two Higgs doublets, you have eight degrees of freedom. There's four charged and four neutral. You eat three degrees of freedom up with the longitudinal components of W plus minus and Z zero. It implies you've got five left five particles left over. Okay. 
there. H0, H0 prime, there's two neutrals. There's a, an, an A0 and H plus H minus. So two of the two of the charge got eaten, there's two left over. One of the neutrals got eaten, there's three left over. These two are those two are scalars. This one if you look up its fermion coupling, it's a pseudoscalar. Which means it couples with gamma five. There are various constraints. Okay. The Actually, I'm sorry, this is, that was, that guy was squared. I was just trying to worry about, about dimensions. The, 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 the gauge piece is squared. Um, you now have to adjust those parameters a bit to get charge-conserving vacuum. These do exist. So H, H, U ends up with one over the square root of two zero V one. H D ends up with square root two zero V two. And actually, I've got that. I've got that wrong. It's actually the V. V goes up here. So, if for some portions of the parameter space, you could have gotten them, where one one of these the charge one picks up a vacuum expectation value, the other one a neutral one picks up a vacuum expectation value. In the, in the standard model, when you just had one you can always rotate that just by the symmetry to put it such that it's in a neutral component. Here you, here you couldn't do it. There'd be clashes. You'd break U1 also. So you have to look at a subset of primary space to break U1, not break U1. That, that works. Um, the ratio, but there are two VEVs now. And beta is V1 over V2. Um, M, you know, Mz squared is G1 squared plus G2 squared over 2. V1 squared plus V2 squared. So just the sum of the vacuum expectation values comes in. There's a relation um, that M H plus and minus squared is MW squared plus MA squared comes out automatically. And if at tree level, if you just do this here, the there's always one Higgs lighter than the Z. This actually the, is no longer true uh, after radiative corrections. But then the lightest Higgs is less than 125 GeV. So it's, it's not much bigger than the Higgs. And the dependence on it is something like the following. Where, where do I have a graph here? Um, if you, you take the function of the the squark masses and tang, tangent beta, 
and if I take um, tangent, so let's let's put I put a one ten here, ninety here, so that's that's the z, um, seventy here, so that's less than the z. Um, I take And beta is 2, it never gets above the z. So it's always ruled out. If you take light squarks, so 1 TV is about here. Let's plot. If you take light squarks, you, you get just barely above the thing. This is this guy picture is tan beta is 10. This is tan beta is 50. So you you barely get above it, but you need large tan beta. Okay, so, so that's one of the lessons. All right. What's the mu problem? So you, th th there's nothing intrinsically wrong here, except that you're, g you're getting partially pushed into corners of parameter space, large tan beta. Higgs mass is just barely consistent with the experiment. So they should be found pretty soon. The mu problem. This is, comes, is that there's two sources of Higgs masses. One is this unbroken supersymmetry. Was mu. So even if supersymmetry is unbroken, you get some contribution. The other is the soft breaking terms. You, the, these are the m. Um, H1 squared, um, MH2 squared, and it was a term called mu b. It was a mixing term. Okay. The, the mu problem is why in the world these are close to each other? Because approximately because it's soft. Because they come from completely different sectors. So remember, su supersymmetry is thought to live at some high energy like the Planck scale. It, it gets broken by something, some mechanism up there, gets communicated by gravitinos to light scales. And, but mu is, is from the unbroken theory, so it's part of the theory before supersymmetry is broken. They just come out close. You actually, you actually need a very, to get these, these vacua, you need the, the following. I, this is copied out of a, some review somewhere. Mu b squared has to be bigger than mu squared plus mu squared plus m1 squared, mu squared plus m2 squared. But, and also, mu squared plus m1 squared plus m2 squared over 2 has to be bigger than mu b. Okay? If you look at those, there's not a lot of room between those. You know, if m1 equaled m2, this and this would just ba barely be satisfied. And so if you take M1 and M2 slightly different, you, there's a very small portion of parameter space. So it's, so this is, th this is for electroweak symmetry breaking. 
finding finding breaking terms and finding charge conserving minimum. Okay. So mu, which is, comes from this completely different sector, has to fit right in the middle of the soft breaking terms. Completely un not understood. Last thing, let me just make some brief comment on flavor physics. Okay. We, this little tour led us through to taking tan beta, which is V1 over V2, big. Okay, so we, we get forced that by the Higgs bound now. The math of the up type quarks, like the mass of the top quark, is some Yukawa coupling times um, V1. The mass of the down type quarks, like the bottom quark, is V2. And so if you get into the large tan beta, large tan beta. To get the, this to work, you normally would have thought the Yukawa coupling of the top quark is the biggest because it's the most massive. But in fact, it reverses this as the lambda b is the largest. And so the there's a lot of new a lot of new physics that this this observation explains a bunch of things is that the B quark becomes more sensitive flavor flavor physics test okay and so this explains when, when you hear talks about this, you'll often hear things like we saw it in the, the um, G minus 2 talk, that the B quark ended up being, being some of the, the natural explanations for these. And this is the naturality of it. Okay. All right. Well, that's basically what I came in basically on time. Um, that's where I stop. Let me just end by saying the following. Here's, here's the, there's a bunch of stuff out there to read. Here's my suggestions if you, if you need to need. The things that I found the most useful in preparing stuff. There are reviews by um, S.P. Martin. Okay, I don't know if there's any other work, but he, he wrote an excellent review. Okay, so he, he, uh, Manuel Dries is actually is um, well known for his work on this, but he has a very nice review too. They both these match nicely to what what you would know, you know. So they they sort of construct the standard model. They're not too formal, etc. And for phenomenology. I like the one by Sally Dawson. Um, there's one by Xerxes Tata, which is good. And of course, there's, ton there's, there's books. And then there's more formal stuff. If you, want, if you want to get into the formal stuff, there's, uh, let me give you that too, but I, I, I didn't do that too much. The Joe Lichen has a good one, and Jonathan Bagger. Okay, so those are the those are the names that I'd recommend. But the the top two are actually ex exceptionally nice. And Sally's phenomenology review is pretty good too. Okay, good. So let's stop there. Next week, Gravity Week. <laughs>